Really appreciate you. Thank you. Praise God. Amen. Good to be here tonight. How many of you can say amen? amen? Ezekiel chapter 33 in the word of God tonight. I want to take this time to, uh, as pastor said, thank everybody who's gone before into the nation. And maybe you've not come to India, but your finances have and your prayers have. And I truly want to let you know from the bottom of our heart that you, amen, you're continuing to make a lot of impact in that nation, amen. Thank you, amen. Uh, uh, all the staff here in Chandler, we thank God for you, uh, your labor, your investment, Sister Connie. And uh, I just uh, sense a great uh, privilege. It's a very humbling experience to stand behind uh, this pulpit where I feel Christ glorified for many years. And especially, amen, behind my pastor's pulpit, I don't take it lightly. Thank you, Pastor, and all the congregation members here in Chandler and those watching online. Ezekiel 33. We've been having such a good conference. How many of you can say amen? amen. You cannot but be blown away with just an unusual presence of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> I heard a story from Pastor Richard Ruby, and I thought it was fitting to share that with you. There was a group of three men who went for hunting one day, a doctor, a lawyer, and a pastor. And as all of them were going for hunting, and they all had their guns loaded, and there was a buck that was uh, there, and suddenly, you know what? All the three shot at the same time, and the buck went down. And all three of them said, it's, it's me who got the animal. It's me. The lawyer said, it's me. And then the doctor said, no, it's me. Then the pastor said, no, it's me. If I'm not wrong, you know, they had probably a friend who traveled with him. And he said, you know, why the confusion? Let me just go and check it out for you. So he went far away, inspected the buck. And then he said, it was the pastor. It was the pastor. These two men contradicted. They said, how can it be? He said, only the pastor's aim is so good. The bullet went through one ear and came out the other. <laughs> And before, before you, amen, are humorous, I want to let you know, let this sermon not go in one and come out of the other. And all this week, I believe God's going to get our attention. Amen, hallelujah. I was uh, listening to an audio book. This is the first audio book I'm listening to. It's a Japanese author by the name of Shishaku Endo. And the book is titled Silence, the story of two Portuguese missionaries who were in the 17th century, they were on a very dangerous journey to Japan to find out that their teacher by the name of Fervier had gone missing in Japan. And these two missionaries, Portuguese missionaries, left from Lisbon on a ship and landed in Goa, India. Goa, India was the gateway to missionary work in the Far East in the early 1600s. These two men, when they landed in Goa, they wanted to find out that, you know, they got reports that their teacher had renounced Christianity and embraced their local religion there. They said, it cannot be. Our teacher has taught us everything. How can it be that he has you know, uh, uh, renounce this. The problem was, amen, they found out there was great persecution in Japan in those days, and the greatest and the boldest missionary, Fervier, had been arrested and renounced. These young men indeed landed out there and did find out all the dynamics there. And in those days, the church in Japan was called the Kakuri Christian, if I, amen, men, you know, spell it properly or pronounce it properly. It means the hidden or silenced Christians. Bold missionaries were silenced for the propagation of the gospel, facing intense torture where they say even crucifixion looked like a child's game. And bold missionaries were silenced. That book titled Silence is a good book to read talks about how the torture and the persecution causes even the boldest and the strongest people to be silenced. And this evening, church, we are living in a generation that way. The 
text we are going to read in Ezekiel chapter 33, the metaphor of a watchman is being ministered here. The watchman was supposed to look out for the enemy, the destruction that was coming, the danger, and he had to sound the warning. And the Bible tells us that we are called to be that watchman who are going to sound the warning and the alarm of a destruction that's coming in the horizon. The night is coming, but you and I cannot be silent and we cannot be silenced. So let's read Ezekiel chapter 33, verse to 1 to 11 quickly. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, when I bring the sword upon the land and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman. When he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet does not take the warning. If the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take the warning. His blood shall be upon himself, but he who takes the warning will save himself. Verse 6, powerful scripture. If the watchman sees the sword coming, does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any person from among them. He is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth. Warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you shall surely die and you do not speak to one the wicked from his way and the wicked man shall die in his iniquity but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity but you have delivered your soul. Verse 10, therefore, O oh, son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus you say if your transgression and your sins are uh, lie upon us and we pine away in them how shall we then live say to them as I live says the God Lord I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live turn turn from your evil ways for why should you die O house of Israel can we pray this evening church let's agree together and pray father we come tonight in this Thursday night of conference, God, your word has been so clear this week. We cannot deny God, Holy Ghost, that your presence in our midst minister to our hearts, raise a watchman for this generation, God, that we shall warn of the coming destruction. God, we shall warn people, God, I'm asking you, Lord, that we will not be silent, neither will we be silenced. Speak to every person here in the church, in the sanctuary, and those watching online oh God your will and purposes be unfolded we pray in Jesus name and all of God's been said Amen. the minister of sermon I've titled the sad sound of silence pastor Paul Alvarez if you're here amen would you lift up your hand amen you were here somewhere amen pastor Paul amen here amen this morning amen you know you have the mind of God my brother Amen. You know what? I was so excited. Sometimes when you have a scripture in silence, you feel, oh, they stepped on my scripture. But you know what? It's such a great joy because I believe, amen, God is trying to get our attention. What you felt this morning up on the stage was not human emotion, my brother. God has put a portion of compassion that you never had. People, amen, who thought you never could make it. The compassion you have never for people. Oh, now you're a total different man. You sense that compassion. And I want to tell you, God has dropped that portion for a purpose. And you're going to see great revival, my brother. Amen. That's a word that God has for you. And I believe, amen, when someone, amen, ministers in the same line, you got to be excited because God is trying to get our attention. Job 33, 14, the Bible says, for God speaks once and even twice, but yet no one notices it. Is God speaking to us? That we're coming to a time where we're going to be silenced? Or those who are silent need to speak up? 
I want to see firstly then on the original silence for a moment. In our text, amen, you know, invading generals in those days, you know, they had the element of surprise. They would sneak in with an attack of stealth. They would come unannounced to their enemies and catch them unexpected and unprepared. So nations, you know, what they would do is they would need a strong army to keep them at bay. But they needed a good alert system to warn the enemy that was approaching. So men were posted at the border to watch and warn in the event of an attack. This human military alarm was called the watchmen. These men would sit on tall towers, scanning across the horizon, would see if dust is being kicked up, whatever, of an approaching army. And when they spot the enemy, they would climb on the tower, they would take a trumpet, and they would begin to blow to the north, to the south, to the east and the west. And that was the job of the watchmen. You know, the truth be said tonight, we are living in a generation. Amen. We have a destruction coming. How many of you can say amen? You know, in those days, you know, this is again, before, amen, I'm not doing any messianic stuff tonight. <laughs> this is just a way of illustration that the watchman would have, you know, a trumpet or something made of an animal or a beast. It could be a ram's horn or it could be any other beast. And, you know, the watchman would always sound this alarm. And, you know, and with that sound, people will be warned of something, amen, that is of catastrophic destruction and people would run. You know what? <laughs> you just heard the saddest sound that you'll never hear. <laughs> That's the sound of silence. A sound of silence that leaves from our lips, echoes through the walls of hell, bringing with it back the screams of people who said, why were we not told? Living in today, international issues with people. Martin Luther said these words, there comes a time in when silence is betrayal. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. For evil to succeed, all it needs is for good men to do nothing. Are we living in a generation where we are being silenced? Or people choose to be silent? Our text tells us that, amen, watchmen sounded the trumpet and when they heard the sound, the group of people would leave everything, what they were doing. They would run into their city for safety. They would begin to gather people and, you know, they would be ready for this attack. But the role of the watchmen, listen to me, my brother and sister tonight, the role of the watchmen was a very humble and an insignificant one until... Until the threat of an attack. How many of you know, amen, an attack, amen, the destruction is coming. Suddenly, listen, suddenly, this watchman's single breath determined life or death. On this trumpet, his single breath. Don't ever under, underestimate the watchman's breath. He didn't care about the size of the army. He didn't care about the sleek strategies. But if the watchmen would not blow the trumpet and warn the people, they would be attacked. I saw, I read, an, I read an article, if you can put that photograph, number one, an article of a man by the name of Tanner Kilby. Tanner Kilby, amen, was in, in Canada. He was going out, uh, uh, you know, for in the beach and he was trying to swim. If you put that photograph, number one, and as he's going there, he's, he sinks down, uh, you know, in, in, in the beach, 14 feet, he's down. He's unable to come up. Tanner Kilby, the one in the center with no shirt on. And you know what? The, and people are panicking now. 
know, this man is not able to come up. And, you know, these two men on either side are not his family. Uh, one of them is the family, but he could not, uh, amen, help him. But the one, amen, uh, to, uh, to, uh, towards the right, amen, the second one, his name is Andrew Pauline. Andrew Pauline, amen, jumps in. He was just in the beach there. You know what? He was just enjoying, but he went down and he pulled him out. And the next thing you know, he's giving him CPR, mouth to mouth resuscitation to a point, amen, you know what? He loses his own breath trying to give Tanner Kilby. These men rejoined, amen, many weeks later, you know what, in that very place where Tanner Kilby, amen, could have died, all because Andrew Pauline breathed into him a breath of life. Can I tell you, people are dying. And you and I have the possibility, amen, of breathing into that gospel trumpet, amen, that people are on their way to hell. You know what, can be rescued at the right time. Watchmen, amen, you know what, people, Never appreciate this simple thing, but you know what? You and I, God uses the imagery of the watchmen to describe the Old Testament prophets. You know, to wake up a sleeping nation of Israel. Can I tell you, we live in a generation that sleeps today. Thank God for our fellowship. How many of you can say amen? But if you're not careful, we can bring that spirit of slumber amongst us. It is fitting for God to describe each and every one of us and the responsibilities that we are gospel messengers. We are the watchmen on the wall. We are the spiritual watchmen for our generation. We are to sound an alarm of an even greater danger for the unprepared for the return of the just and the holy God is at hand. But there is no alarm in the church. The church has disarmed its alarms. Nations and cities need Christ, but I think tonight churches need Christ. If the church gets Christ, I think, amen, nations will get Christ. The Bible calls, uh, amen, you and I to be the watchmen who are able to, amen, sound the alarm. But you know what? It's good also to sound the alarm in church. We are called to wake the church, not to sing sweet lullabies. The prophet Isaiah doesn't mince words. When he speaks about lazy watchmen, he says in Isaiah 56, verse number 9, they are blind and ignorant and they are all dumb dogs who cannot bark. They sleep and lie down loving to slumber. Oh, we live in a modern day church world that is sleeping and COVID has only made things even harder. Isaiah 51, 1, the 58, 1, the Bible says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Jesus Christ himself used these words. Matthew 24, verse number 42, watch therefore, everybody say watch. Therefore, you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. In other words, God was telling, we can literally translate, be a watchman. Jesus told his, amen, disciples to sound the alarm. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And we've heard this message many years, but it's so easy for the sin of familiarity to step in. The holy judge is coming. And I'm telling you and I need to be prepared and warn people who are unprepared. It fits properly today, amen, to be called a watchman in today, amen, today's time. I believe, amen, today's believers, you and I are called to be that watchman. And the future of many people and nations and cities are resting upon the obedience of those, amen, who are going to take the commission of God seriously. And I believe, amen, our conference, you know, especially in the week, Thursday and Friday is when we see men saying, you know what, I'm going to go sound the alarm. My wife and I, we are headed out. You heard great reports. We rejoice with them. But the truth be said tonight, every one of us are called to fulfill that duty. God has placed in our hands, maybe not, amen, a kudu's horn or a ram's horn, but he has placed a gospel trumpet in our hands. That's the only time those who do not know music have the ability to play music, the gospel trumpet. You and I need to ask ourselves, am I fulfilling the responsibility of a watchman? Are there people that are ignorant of the warning? Because you and I could have been fallen asleep or, you know, out of our post, not sounding the alarm. Are there people around us who have not heard the gospel? 
Like Pastor Birch and Pastor Alvarez said, we, we kid you not when we tell that people do not know who Jesus Christ is. You cannot fathom that. But I want to tell you that shocks us. Oswald Chambers said, no one has the right to hear the gospel twice while there remains many who haven't heard it once. How many times we hear, but yet there are groups and people groups and nations and cities that do not know Jesus Christ. God is looking for watchmen in this hour tonight. Are we so busy? Oh, are we a watchman? I got a gospel trumpet. By and large, the church is polishing its trumpet. See how shiny this goes with my suit. <laughs> Putting our trumpet, amen, on WhatsApp and Instagram and social media. Never, never sounding it. That's the saddest sound of silence. God help us if we have a gospel trumpet and never, never blow it out. Is God speaking to us once and twice to get our attention tonight? Is he getting it? Because you know, where did the silence start? The original silence, you know the story. Started at the Garden of Eden. Adam was silent, brought a spiritual death. Pastor Campbell's masterpiece sermon on the silence of Adam. And I'm telling you, silence is a form of communication that God will hold us accountable for. Silence, you know, pastor said, when a man is silent, chaos reigns. When a man is silent, disobedience starts. It started in the garden. If you're not careful, that can get a hold of us. Jacob was silent. He settled in Shechem. You know the story, his daughter is being raped. He's doing nothing. His sons come, kill these men of Shechem. Jacob is upset, but these men said, no, it's for the honor of our sister. The Bible says in Genesis 34, 5, now Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob kept silent as they came in. Oh, are we a generation that just keeps silence? That's the original silence. I want to see secondly then on today's silence for a moment. The failure in our duty towards sounding the alarm. You know what God says in our text, verse number eight. When I say to the wicked, oh wicked man, you shall surely die and do not, you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. See, you and I cannot be watchmen who, feel, who fall asleep at our post. We cannot fail to sound the alarm because the invading enemy would have killed those people. Then the watchman is going to be held responsible. That's what the Bible says for his failure. Could we be guilty of negligent homicide tonight? That we may not have directly killed somebody, but you know, we could have been an accomplice. Not just, amen, you know what, that, but we share the responsibility and maybe God will charge us with, amen, derelation of duty. Because our silence is more destructive, not just as silent observers, but we become silent accomplices. When we walk into nations like you heard these missionaries, I'm telling you, how can you be silent? The problem is, amen, we take things for granted many times. In our text, if we do not sound the warning, which is the only hope? How many of you still believe Jesus is the only hope for humanity? God says, I will hold you accountable and their blood will be upon your head. God challenges us to reach all, but we've all messed up. When we should have told people, you know, I've had times where God told me to go, maybe witness to someone or you know what, uh, talk to somebody and the next thing, you know, I've had instances where that person has passed into eternity. And you got to live with that forever. My wife's, amen, nephew, young, young man, 19 years old. You know what, uh, for quite some time he had trouble. He went into drugs and all of those things. Uh, you know, we thought, you know what, we can somehow work with him. And I remember once my wife and I talked to him. He used to come to church. Uh, you know, he had a decision to be made, but he had some problems with family and all of those things. Uh, but I remember, amen, when you know, God, one day we got a shocking news that he had committed suicide. 
He was on the railway tracks, amen. Come under a moving train. They had to pick him up in pieces, amen. You know what? My heart broke. My wife and I said, oh, we could have done something better. All of us may be guilty of that in our own ways. That people, we had the opportunity to go visit, speak, tell, but we delayed because of our own comfort and our own schedules and then to find out they entered into eternity. How can you live with that? How can we live with that? That's what God says, I will hold you accountable. God challenges all of us to do that. And you and I have been maybe watchmen like that who've messed up. But one day we will be standing before God and our hands will be dripping of the blood of people that is upon our hands. Will your hands be dripping from the blood that God places on your head of people that you should have said? You should have gone to? Conference after conference, the finger of God has been so, amen, evident on you, but yet you choose not to. God says, that city, that nation that I kept talking to you, now that blood is upon you. Because you were silent. You know what? In our text it says, you and I are not just accountable to the people who are unevangelized. I want to tell you, it changes the whole ball game in verse number eight when the Bible says, but his blood I will require at your hand. It is not just the unevangelized who's saying, why didn't you tell me? But God is telling, I am asking you, why didn't you tell them? We are accountable to the living God. You know, this, this generation hates accountability. It's in us. That's our carnality. But God says, I will hold you accountable. You know, the church will be held accountable. Amen. People who are, amen, you and I are called to be the watchmen. God says, I am going to hold you accountable for our silence. And I want to tell you, silence is sin tonight. First Corinthians chapter 9 verse 16 45 preach the gospel I have nothing to boast or of necessity a uh, boast of for necessity is laid upon me yes woe is me if I do not preach the gospel Paul knew what it was to be called woe is me today many people put up their theological objections when I talk to them against the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Ah, that applies to the Old Testament. But don't you believe that Old Testament is also part of the Bible? Yes. If you say you're the full gospel, amen, we believe it from cover to cover. Yes. Paul says, Acts 18, 6, but when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. Can anybody say, I am clean? Yes. Why does Paul say that? Acts 20 was 26 to 27. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men for I am not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Paul is saying, I am innocent from the blood of people because I told you, I warned you, I was not silent. So if that means if we are silent, we are guilty. How many church would stand and God would pronounce you guilty? Others argue, you know what, how can God punish the unevangelized for my silence? Yes, the Bible does say, the text tells us that God will judge them for their sin, but it's our silence that seals their doom. So let's not start into a theological argument against the conviction of the Holy Ghost. For God has ordained only one means to save all sinners, and that is the preaching of the gospel. That is, amen, repent, for there is, amen, only the way to go to heaven through Jesus Christ. And that's what, amen, we do in our church. You know, it's, it has been entrusted into our hands. This gospel trumpet is entrusted into our hands. I want to tell you tonight, amen, listen to me, church is essential. How many of you can say amen? I want to tell you the gospel is essential. Amen. We you and I have to be extremely mindful in these areas. Nothing is more precious to God than souls. Nothing is more precious. Because he created them. He created them. Nothing God will require from you and I, amen, except us reach the souls. You know what? That is as simple as that. He didn't tell us, you know, to take care of this, that, the other, and all of that. He said, I want you to win souls. How sad today that many churches won't even preach on righteousness because they want to be silent. Because it's too political. I want to tell you tonight, we are not called to be political. We are called to be biblical. Yes. As simple as that. 
God ordained the government. And I want to tell you tonight, governments cannot silence us. I come from a nation that wants to silence us. But I want to tell you tonight, this sermon was written to myself. I said, you are not going to be silent. Because that's the work of the demonic that wants to, amen, shut down the voice. The very thing that's going to save people. But the truth be said, many people are impacted. See, what we say and what we do not say impacts politics any which ways. Some people say, I'm not want to be polit political, bro. You're just hiding your cowardliness. That's simple as that. We are called to speak. Bold preaching. Can I tell you, amen, men who are preachers out there, bold preaching. We may look on the wrong side of humanity, but we are on the right side of eternity for sure. People may say, you're on the wrong side. I don't care because I'm on the right side of eternity. We cannot abandon our posts. How many churches have been shut down? You know what? Because the watchman has gone out. The watchman found something else to do. Negligent of our assignments and remaining silent. And those who neglect this responsibility to proclaim the gospel. We are guilty of faithlessness, treachery, derelation of duty. And you know we knowingly see people on their way to hell. And we remain silent. There may be some here you may say. You are using guilt as a motivator. For people to fulfill the commission. My point is not here to stir up your guilt. My point here is to stir up our compassion. How many of you know we serve a God of compassion? That when he saw the multitudes, the Bible says he was moved with compassion. Some people say, I was moved, pastor. You didn't move from your seat to the altar. We are not afraid, amen, to show our emotions because you know what? That's compassion. Dying souls. God open our eyes to the duty that is before us. Why does God demand us to be faithful? Not to be silent. To the wicked. Who cares that the wicked go to hell? Who are you and I to say that church? Look at what the Bible says in verse number 11. That will mess you up. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Sometimes we become like Jonah, let them all go to hell. When God says, you know what, I want to see them saved. The truth be said, I want to tell you, God wants to see, amen, nations come to him. That's the wonderful thing about world evangelism because you know what? We're sending out watchmen. We're going to go out and sound the alarm because you know what? I am a product of Thursday night. Amen. I have Pastor Alex and Sister Florence Ambrose from Bangalore with us. Amen. He's one of our, amen, baby church pastors. But you know what? We are here today because somewhere along the line on a Thursday night, couples, amen, responded and sounded the alarm and they were not silent. But yet there are many nations and even cities in America where silence reigns and there is chaos. Who will be those? Your single breath is going to determine whether they go to heaven or hell. Your single decision to walk down the aisle, lay your life down, sacrifice. The truth be said, greatest prosperity is not found outside the will of God. It is found bang in the middle of the will of God. God loves the lost. He commands us to take care of this business. There are many motivations in the Bible for evangelism and church planting. But I want to tell you what surpasses everything is a love for people. Our pastor has a love for people. How many of you can say amen? Sometimes, you know what? We never know the value of something till we lose it. Pastor Campbell has been a great blessing to all of us and the fellowship. His heart for people blows me away. I always prayed, God, make me like him. But I said, it's hard to be like him. But I want to tell you, you know where he gets it from? Because he loves the loving God. And when you love the loving God, you become a loving people. 
And if you have a hint of God's love in you, you're not going to, amen, hide the gospel. You're not going to, amen, uh, what, I, what do I say, amen, you're not going to uh, uh, keep the gospel silent or hold it. You're going to take the gospel trumpet and blow it the harder. The greater you love God, the greater, amen, you're going to put into those lungs. Some believers have spiritual COVID. Their lungs are messed up. I cannot blow. I want to tell you our God is a healer. Yeah. 1 John chapter 4 verse number 8. Very quickly 1 John 4 8. He who does not love does not know God. For love is not God. For God is love. Nothing is more unloving than the silencing of the gospel. Which is the only hope for salvation. You know what is an NDA? An NDA means a non-disclosure agreement. Many people have signed an NDA with a demonic. Non-disclosure. Just like, amen, we heard about Neymar. The Me Too movement, silencing people with money. Can I ask you a question? What silences you? What silences you? We get into an NDA, non-disclosure agreement. Had a lady in my church said, Pastor, I stopped praying because every time I pray, my kids get sick. So I told the devil, leave my kids alone. I will not pray. She did an NDA with a demonic. Sometimes you can be silent because job silenced you. A business silenced you. Your wife silenced you. Your husband silenced you. Your kids silenced you. Fear silenced you. Whatever tonight, can I ask you a question? Who silences you? We have a spiritual Me Too movement here. Many a once, amen, many people once who had the gospel trumpet laid it down today to be silent to pursue other things. Where are you watchmen tonight? Where are you watchmen? That God says, I have a city, I have a nation. That all I need you to do is pick that back up again. Because how many of you know, to pick something up, you got to leave something down. There is no amen going to, there are no serving two masters. Fulfill our calling. See, Charles Spurgeon said these words, but so live when you hear the funeral knell for a neighbor even. May you be able to say, poor soul, whether he's gone to heaven or hell, I know not. I am clear of his blood. Oh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if sinners are damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they perish, let them perish with our arms above their knees, imploring them to stay, not madly to destroy themselves if hell must be filled at least let it be filled with the teeth of our exertions let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for and if that has to be true we cannot be silent we cannot be silenced there is a sad sound of silence today That's what it sounds like. The God in heaven comes up and watch. He's not just the God who hears, sees, he's a God who hears. I want to close tonight on the obligation to speak. Ezekiel says, speak up, sound up the alarm. John the Baptist was a watchman in the New Testament. Peter, after Pentecost, stood up and preached. Can I tell you, church, silence is not an option. Look at your neighbor and say, silence is not an option. But do you really mean it? God heard it. God heard it. When Miriam and Aaron were saying, does God only speak to Moses? Doesn't he speak to us? The Bible says, and he heard them. We repeat what the preachers say, but we really don't mean what it is. I always tell many Christians lie during song service. I surrender. We don't surrender. I'm giving you my heart. Your heart's not there because you've given it to something else. I fix my eyes on. It's not fixed on him. How do you know, pastor? You're seeing one. God had to convict me. Don't, don't ever sing if you don't really mean it. 
We sing, oh, I'm ready to go to the ends of the earth. End of the street to Walmart would be good first. I thank God for your applause, but I'm here tonight for a response. God help us if we walk away from here with no response. It would just be a waste of time. You could have found something else to do. Isaiah 21, I close with this scripture that really messed me up. Isaiah 21, verse number 11 to 12, the burden against Duma. He calls me out of seer, watchmen, what of the night? Watchmen. What of the night? The watchman said the morning comes. But also the night, if you will inquire, inquire, return. Come back. You know the story. The Assyrians are going to at attack Jerusalem. City Edom, neighboring country there is Edom. The king of Edom sends emissaries to the man of God and says, you know what's going to happen, man? Isaiah, the man, man of God during those time. The Bible says, Amen. They wanted to know what was going to happen to them. The burden of Duma. Duma means silence. Do we have a burden for the nations? We cannot run on our pastor's burden. How many of you know we need to have our own personal burden? Amen. The truth be said, when we come to the altar, to the cross of Calvary, no doubt burdens are taken away, but there is also a burden that is placed, and that's the burden for lost souls. That's a burden for lost souls. Do we have that burden today? Do we have that burden? Watchmen, what of the night? We want to know what is going to happen to our nation. Do you know the night is coming? Watchmen, what of the night? Watchmen, what of the night? Jesus people movement. Thank God, amen, for our fathers who stepped out with the gospel trumpet. Mockery and all of those things set a great pattern for us. You and I are not supposed to be those people, amen, the generation where there was sound, but then it's a flat line and anything that's flat means it's dead. Silence is deathly. Someone said these words, silence is golden. But speech is platinum. We got to speak out. The spirit of silence that wants to come upon our lives. There are people here you struggle to open up and witness to people. You do not want to go. There are other men here. You're on, you have this struggle as the Holy Ghost is ministering tonight to me. There are men here. You have a strong calling to be an evangelist, but you have been struggling and trying to divert it. The Lord would speak to you tonight that God is calling you to be the watchman to the nations, that you are going to be faithful to talk to your pastor and say, God is calling me into this office. Being an evangelist is not just a Pentecostal purgatory. It's a calling. That I am fulfilling this calling, going into the nations, amen, in big or small cities, and the gospel trumpet warning people. And we need evangelists in these last days. Every one of us can do the work of the evangelist. Have the desire for that. We need to be stirred up. Because cities are burning down, racial turmoils. I'm telling you, sickness and economy and all of those things. I'm telling you, we need the Holy Ghost. The church has to come out of quarantine. We have to step out and do what God has called us to do. It's time for us to rise up, church, and take, amen, the trumpet and blow into nations that need to hear the gospel. Today is not a usual service. It's Thursday night. We are not called to be cheerleaders. We are called to be game changers today. I'm not here to ask you to, you know, cheer. No, thank God. But you know what? I want us to be game changers. Conviction will take place. Hallelujah. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin and grave. Weep over the erring one. Lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus who is mighty to save. And that's what we need. A photograph of a young man, amen, in my church. Quickly, if you can put that up, amen, he's a pastor. Ravi Kumar, him and his family, 
got saved. He's a pastor in our fellowship, amen, in, and living for God. And March of this year, his son, young son, amen, Stephen, went on to be with the Lord. He went into a, a, an accidental death, was stuck in between the lift for, for lack of graphic areas. He was dragged in between the lift doors and he was mangled up. This man is serving God, living for Jesus Christ. Great catalyst, a great upcoming leader. Leadership, heart for the gospel, whatever. Myself, Pastor Alex, amen, we are doing his son's funeral. I was out of town that time, but I came in, was able to do his funeral, put the next photo up. Amen, you know what, Stephen, this young man, he's preaching, he's a church planter, he's a discipler of men, he's investing finances, amen, and this, that, the other, you know what, and he says, this is what, you know what, pastor, he makes a statement in the funeral, he says, you know what, we are not going to turn back. We are not going to allow our circumstances and even the depth of my son to silence us. And he says, you know what, just recently, I had him talk to Pastor Campbell because how do you talk to someone who's just lost their son? And he spoke to Pastor Campbell. He was very gracious to speak to him. But then you know what, just before I could come, I was, he was in my office, he said, Pastor, God is calling me to be a missionary. Wherever, Pastor, the Lord would speak, I'm willing to go. Because even circumstances has the ability to silence you. Some of us, we lose a job and we want to lay down the trumpet. We lose a little bit of sleep. Ah, this is not for me. Loses a son, follows great exampleship of our fathers and says, you know what? Hell, demonic, you're not going to silence me. I'm going to go into the nations. I close with this statement. Many of you have a master plan for your life. But what's very important is not you have a master plan for your life. Do you have the master's plan? That is critical. That is critical. And today the altar is going to reveal that to us. While every eyes is closed, every heads are bowed. Those watching online, we thank God for your patience.